So here we go. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I should say. Welcome to our Drop the Leash uh, Facebook uh, Live on Thursdays. Uh, my name is Laura Hunter. I am um, um, the owner of Drop the Leash Dog Training. And this is Celeste. I'm here with Celeste Gagnon, who teaches all my classes with me at Drop the Leash as well. So last week, we were talking about the um, influences of evolution on our dog's behaviors. Um, so this week, what we're going to talk about is, again, is the effect of genetics on dog behavior. But today we're going to talk about breeding and not... Um, not in the sense of talking about current uh, breeding practices, about which I know very little, um, but past ones. So we tend to think of our dogs as pets. Um, their job is to hang out with us all day and just fit into their lives as, you know, to the best of, of our, their ability. I'm sorry, Celeste, my mouth seems to be not connected to my brain today. That's okay. <laughs> I'll get on it. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, our dogs um, have actually been on the job for a long, long time. So when dogs and people first started cohabitating, uh, we didn't really need pets. We didn't think of dogs as pets. Um, our ancestors looked at dogs and thought, wow, how could this dog be useful to me? And so they created working dogs. So we have herding dogs, we had pulling dogs, hunting dogs, protection dogs, ratting dogs, um, dogs that would swim and pull, you know, food out of fish, I guess, out of lakes, Portuguese water dogs. So we started building specifically uh, breeding for all of those skills. And we specifically selected for those skills. So we only bred the dogs who were really good at their specific job. So those behaviors were handed down from those dogs throughout the generations um, genetically. And those behaviors became part of our dog's actual DNA. Um, and that's the field of epigenetics. So how does that impact dogs and owners today? Well, <laughs> most people want a pet dog, a pet dog. Um, one similar maybe to Lassie, a dog that's easy to train, understands and hangs on our every word, does the right thing in every situation, a dog that is ready to spring into action when we need it, and one that can stand down when we want them to chill. The problem is that most of our dogs still think they need to be doing the other job, the one they were actually bred to do and they don't know, really know how to be lassie. So, you know, in our pet dogs, there are thousands of years of reinforcement history for doing that job. Um, environmental cues can trigger those behaviors by literally turning on that switch in their DNA. And they instinctively launch into that behavior. Although in modern, um, modern day, it's usually pretty much in the wrong context. And then as a reinforcement, they receive this huge shot of dopamine, which is that feel good chemical that comes from your brain. So there's a lot of reinforcement history. And so all of these behaviors are self-reinforcing. Um, if I think of Annie, my oldest one, um, Annie's greatest joy in life is barking. Um, you know, and so, um, my dogs bark at any noise in the environment, and, and she's always the one to start it. Um, you know, she just, anything they hear, they if Brett's coming in, if Brett parks his car in the driveway, if he puts his hand on the latch of the gate outside, even if he walks into the living room from another room, you know, they're totally sound asleep, and before I can even blink, they're on their feet barking, 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 barking. And there are times when Annie just barks and doesn't stop, and we have no idea why she's barking. So it, you can tell it's a self-reinforced behavior. But I didn't realize until I was informed that um, herding dogs are bred to respond to what we call SEC, sudden environmental change, any minute change in the environment. So, um, you know, when they were actually able to do the job as herding dogs, any, you know, if, if you looked up and your sheep were running away, or if you looked up and a predator was approaching, you needed to alert everybody and try and gain control over the situation. So um, that's what's happening in my house. It happens 20 times a day. 
Um, do I have the ability to stop it? No, um, there are things I can do though, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that a little further on. Um, so there's a, a good example of how um, a behavior that my dog was bred for can be like totally self-reinforcing for her. So, um, Celeste, you have um, herding dogs. Have you got a behavior like that in your house? I'm sure you have. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> There's your opening. <laughs> yeah, Penny's always on duty. Um, and it's funny that you say it's like self-reinforcing because, and I know this is me putting on a human um, attribute to Penny, but she looks super proud of herself when she starts barking at something. Yeah, It's like she gets, her tail goes up, her head is all picked up and she's like, alert, alert, alert. Yeah, and, and then she's running back and forth between us and the window. Like we need to know this. And she's so, she's doing her job. Like she's just so proud of what she's doing. Yeah, totally you reinforcing. Know. It is, totally. she's she's totally happy doing that. It, yeah. Me, not so much. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, they're happy. They're yeah. happy. You know, so, you know, fortunately we've adjusted and we've learned to understand it and we have learned to deal with it, both of us in certain ways. But, you know, a lot of owners just see their puppies as a blank slate. There's always nature, nurture, you know, um, which is which. And, and there are a lot of people who think, well, I am just going to take this little puppy and I am going to raise it and I'm going to teach it absolutely everything it needs to know. And we're going to create the dog that we want it to be. And let's just forget. Well, maybe people don't know, or maybe they've forgotten, or maybe they just choose to ignore all the learning that has already gone on genetically. You know, so you know, for many um, people, the dog that they actually want or need um, would tend to be probably less active, both mentally and physically, in in modern life. Um, and um, so, you know, over the past year, um, there, everybody bought a dog. Um, <laughs> it seems like everybody bought a dog. And um, not everybody could uh, possibly get the dog they wanted. I know a lot of our clients um, ended up, and a lot of people I've talked to ended up getting different breeds than the ones they originally mm -hmm. intended to get because there was such a waiting list just to get dogs. Um, and others um, bought dogs because they just thought that was the breed they wanted, I, I guess. But I know that there were a lot of people over the, um, not necessarily our clients, but a lot of people over the past year that bought dogs with the um, word Aussie in the name. So um, there were lots of Aussies and lots of Aussie doodles. And I re would receive several calls um, throughout the winter from people who said, oh my God, I just want him to sleep. Can you just tell me how to get this dog to sleep for more than five minutes during the day? Um, you know, I, I, there was no easy answer to that, um, but other than, that's, it's not gonna happen with a 20 minute walk twice a day around the block for a Nazi, you know? Um, I, and, and we had a lot of them on the field in the puppy program. And I think you and I would laugh because all the other puppies are like playing away and wrestling and interacting. And the Aussie doodles and the Aussie puppies were searching the field in a grid-like pattern for food with their- yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's all they wanted to do. And we went, look, they have a job, <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think a lot of people pick dogs also because, just because of the appearance, right? They don't really look deeper than that. Aussies are adorable. They're fluffy. They're like teddy bears when they're babies. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you, it's hard to resist. Well, and I met my first Aussie when um, I went up north several years ago when we were running the horse program and I took all my staff with me and we went to a riding camp at a ranch and there was an Aussie there, gorgeous red Aussie. Um, and its job, we were doing team penning, and its job was to herd the cattle all back into the pen when we were finished. And I watched this thing for three days, and all I could think was, I want a dog. I want that dog. I want a yeah. dog. Because it looked cool. And my God, it was great. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what's going through my head because I don't have cattle. But, you know, um, and I <laughs> came home and I started looking, and I ended up with three of them. So it's so easy to look at a dog and go, oh my God, I want a dog that does that. Um, we know yeah. movies, you know, after these movies come yeah. out, the 
you know, with the dogs in the movies that look really cool, um, you know, we see a surge in those breeds, you know, in, out in the world. Um, I'm wondering, we're seeing a lot of Malinois these days. I'm wondering if it was from the John Wick movies, because I watched I watched those John Wick movies. They were terrible movies, but I just watched them for the Malinois. Yeah, who are and, always impressive. Like, who doesn't want a dog that can run up the side of a house? <laughs> How handy. Hey, I want to make her cattle. I'm not criticizing anybody. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. I um, I mean, I've always loved the look of Dalmatians, and I'm sure it's from when I was a kid because I love the cartoon, 101 Dalmatians. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, no, I didn't it's hard not to be influenced. Yeah, I know. I don't know what movie's coming out next. Um, uh, there is a 101 Dalmatians, a live action one that just came out. So we'll be seeing some. Oh, sorry. Another? Yeah, well, they did a live action of it again. Oh, my goodness. So we'll see more Dalmatians in a bit. Oh, my goodness. Okay, well, you know. <laughs> we'll That's, see. I'll get my fix without actually owning one. It'll be great. Yeah, well, we can see them in the program. I'm exactly. Sure. We have exactly. one. We have, we have one. one. Yeah. Beautiful well, one. Well, you know, the point is when we expect – behaviors from our dogs that they aren't programmed to offer yeah. or when we see them displaying these bred in working traits we, we tend to think that dogs behavior is bad or is broken we need to fix it mm -hmm. but often what people need to do is um what what is fix or change their expectations of of what's going on with their dog um so for us it's it's always about educating our clients is more about educating our clients lately than is training dogs so that they understand the why of the behavior so once we understand the why it's it's easier for us to work together for a solution mm -hmm. that works for everybody and you know most dogs aren't broken they're not badly bred dogs um usually what we see are just dogs that are misunderstood or just being what they're bred to be but either the, you know they can't they they can't per, they're in a situation where they can't be what they were bred to be or the owners don't understand what they were bred to be. And, and again, I'm not dumping on owners. I didn't know about any of this stuff particularly until I went out and started taking you know, courses and listening to people who were more qualified than I am. Um, you know, I'm thinking years ago, um, for some reason, um, this is when I was a kid, so that was a long time ago. My aunt, for some reason, decided to breed German Shepherds and my grandfather bought one. And it was this big, pure black German Shepherd. And like, there was never any thought of, of training this dog at all. Um, there was no training. My grandfather was an old guy by the time he got this dog. Like nobody thought about training it. Um, it lived in their kitchen and it lived in the backyard, which was about um, the size of my sunroom. And nobody did anything with it. So. Um, they, they actually sawed a door in half and I like, used to see it when you came in the house, you'd see it, look down the hall and see this thing hanging over the, <laughs> this door and nobody would go into the room with it because it would jump all over you and it stole food off the counter and my grandfather would put his face down to talk to it and the thing would be going <laughs> and then going, oh my God. Yeah. Um, you know, and there was nothing, and they said, oh, you know, it was either a bad dog or it was a brain damaged dog, but it was just a completely non-trained dog who had absolutely no access to any sort of stimulation or any sort of ability to engage in any breed specific behaviors, you know, and that's a working dog brain with absolutely nothing to do. You know, so it was when I think back on it, poor dog, you know, it was just a horrible life for it in the kitchen hanging over the door, you know, um, you know, and, and, you know, there are times when when people are happy to work with their dogs and teach them skills. But at times, depending on your breed and your knowledge of what they were bred for, sometimes the skills we're trying to work on them. Uh, work with on uh, for them are not realistic skills at all. You know, um, we've had a, I've had a few examples over the past few months. Um, you know, I had somebody call me. Um, well, actually, somebody we know, Celeste, but not naming names, who has a herding dog. Then they really want that herding dog to become a pet therapy dog. And you know, there's nothing wrong with a herding dog becoming a pet therapy dog. I'm pretty sure that Rosie could be a pet therapy dog in, in a heartbeat. But this particular dog has no interest in any people other than its owners. And yeah. 
completely focused totally on its owner. So um, I don't think that's pet therapy material, uh, other than it would sit completely still and stay, stare at its owner while someone petted it. But <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure we're going to make that connection that, that needs to be made with a therapy dog, you know, yeah. and human, you know, or... Um, you know, I know of a couple of uh, people not in our program who have um, purchased livestock guardian dogs and they live in downtown Toronto. Mm -hmm. You know, livestock guardian dogs do not do well in a house. They need to be outside and when they're outside, they're going to protect, which means they're not going to be particularly quiet dogs unless they're completely supervised when they're outside. Um, and I know this because we have one you know, we're not in the city, we're rural, but I know we've got one across the road that we've had to talk to the owners about several times because it, it wanders, it doesn't have a recall, and um, it uh, it barks all day, it barks all day long. So, you know, um, it, it, it doesn't work rurally, so I doubt it's gonna work in an urban area, you know? And um, last one is um, I somebody wanted, um, they, they bought a, a, a hunting dog, a pointer, I think, um, and wanted to know the best way to teach it to stay with them when they're backpacking um, up north into the wild country and canoe packing without ever putting a line on it. And I'm thinking, well, you know, um, it's, that's just not realistic because they're probably going to lose that dog into the woods on the first trip. You know, um, there's a good chance. There's a good chance because mm -hmm. those are dogs who are bred to go off into the woods and hunt and find, you know, be independent and not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, is it going to come back? So, you know, realistic expectations about the breed that you buy um, does make for a happier household. You know, um, even, you know, our dogs, we, we've all got barkers here, um, you know, and it is, um, as I said earlier, it is, it is annoying. It happens 25 times a day and, and now it happens like five, six times a night. So um, it's annoying, but I think you and I both have learned that this is something that they were bred to do and it would be cruel and inhuman to, um, to try and suppress it. Although I, I'm, I think you do the same thing I do, which is um, we just say thank you and that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And we will heavily reinforce you for going to your crates and going to lie down on your mats. We understand that you can't help it. It's an instinctive response that's part of your DNA. And, um, but, you know, we can't, Told it we can't deal with 10 minutes of it, a couple of barks, and yeah, please go to your bed, and we will heavily reinforce you for doing that. And it works. Mm -hmm. It works. Yeah, it does. Uh, um, we certainly, you and I, have no unrealistic expectations of, <laughs> you know, um, suppressing that behavior completely. It's no. just never going to happen. Well, and to be honest, I don't, I don't necessarily want to because, I mean, I, I don't even have salespeople come to my door anymore. <laughs> so there are, there are perks to this. <laughs> Well, I would like to suppress it here because it's just my husband they're barking at. He yeah, that's true. All day long. That's but, true. You know, what can you do? But a couple, um, a couple bar alert barks and then enough. That's that's the beauty. I like that. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, um, actually, let me ask you, Celeste, when because you and I both um, switched from. Um, Goldens. Well, I, I had a few lemons in between. Um, we switched from goldens to um, to herding dogs. And so, what caused you to make that switch? What caused you to buy a herding uh, dog in the first place? Um, the herding dog was because oh, okay, the golden was my first dog. So, and I knew I knew the breeder well. I still do. She's a good friend. Um, so I knew her dogs and I knew how lovely and wonderful they were and that they were fairly easy going first dogs. I could handle it as somebody who's never owned a dog before. Um, when we lost her, it was kind of a heartbreak. So I couldn't do a golden again. That was the only reason I couldn't do it. Uh, and I just decided maybe I was ready for a bit more of a challenge. So that's why I picked a shepherd. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so it was, it was a lot more challenge than I had in my, in my exactly. mind. Exactly. So, so let me ask the next question. 
<laughs> did you do research before you bought? You know what? I did, but not in the right places necessarily. You yeah. know? So, yeah. so like I knew that they were trained as police dogs and protection dogs. I had no interest in protection training. Um, I'd seen videos with the, the shits and the sporting dogs, and I had no interest in that either. Um, but then you also see like just the shepherd that is lounging around and it's like, you're maybe I'll get a calm one. I'll be good. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you don't really see the whole picture necessarily. No, no. no. I, you know, I, I have to say, um, we didn't either. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, for anybody out there who's thinking, oh my gosh, I bought the wrong dog. I don't want to want more. And I am, mm -hmm. well, we, we're, we didn't do much. Um, we didn't do our due diligence no. either. No. So I remember um, when, um, this is quite a while ago, we had a golden, we've always had multiple dogs and my husband decided he had a, a keys hound, which was a fabulous. And um, when it died, he decided he wanted another sort of northern type breed. So he um, he wanted a Malamute. So I spent like six months reading him horror stories <laughs> on the internet about Malamutes eating the houses and eating um, eating you know all the uh, sprinkler systems in the lawns and eating the electrical system. And and I came home one night and he said I bought a Malamute. And I thought okay. Um, and, and it did, it ended up eating the inside of our car and all the food belts um, you know, on one occasion. But um, we had no idea what um, we really had. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, fortunately we got through 14 years with him, um, but there were there were some issues. He was a killer of all small animals, um, cost us a fortune in cats because barn cats didn't know not to approach him. Um, and um, you know, there were times there were certainly in certain situations, we wouldn't have gone toe to toe with him. And I went to a trainer back then because I had a thought in my head that the dog did need some structure and some discipline and some leadership. And and they do. They do um, to a certain degree. And I did go to um, a trainer a long time ago who um, kind of helped us. But, you know, um, it's interesting because I was reading Kim Brophy's book the other day. I was reading it last night, actually. Um, for anybody who hasn't heard us talk about Kim Brophy, she uh, she is an applied ethologist, and um, I'm going to be taking a two-year course with her. I'm so exciting, so excited about that. And I've heard her talk. You and I have heard her talk many times. She's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Most of the information that I'm passing on today is not coming out of my brain. It's coming out of Kim Brophy, yeah. um, her books and webinars. And... Um, she what she's done is um, divided dogs into ten groups in in that book Meet the Dog and and the explanations are fantastic and when I read the one I think she calls them natural dogs they're a little bit more primitive a little closer to um, wolves and and the wild dogs when she uh, when I read that I thought that was the Malamute she mm. just really nailed it um, that's interesting not a dog for a city, not a dog for inexperienced owners. We'd had a number of dogs at that point and I was dabbling in training, but definitely um, really, I think we just kind of blind, blind luck got the expectations um, right for him because um, there were just things we wouldn't ask him to do basically. Um, and, um, and we kind of sort of figured out his personality, but he was just a typical, typical Malamute, you know, like we were in the beginning horrified because he would kill, he killed, killed a couple of cats. Um, but then you've, you know, I, down, I, I, I looked on the internet, I did some research way back then and thought, okay, yeah, they are bred to, you know, hunt for themselves because they were primitive dogs. Nobody fed them out of a bowl. And when the, um, when the Inuit aren't working with them, they turn them loose to hunt for themselves. They don't feed them if they're not working with them. So, you know, we figured that out and we didn't hold it against them, but it was more trial and error than anything. So, yeah. You know, and even with the herding dogs, you and I both know that we've learned so much from Brophy about yes. herding dogs that they are, you know, micromanaging, hyper vigilant control freaks who, you know, have to <laughs> control restore order to all environments. You know, Annie's picture should be beside her that description in the book. You know, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. So 
So do you think when people get dogs, it'd be more useful for them instead of researching the breed, researching the the family of like the grouping that they're bred? Yeah, from? yeah, that that is definitely. If you go through that book, that is definitely a more um, a more practical and realistic way to look at it. You know, um, definitely better than reading the little tiny one inch column in the back of Dogs in Canada, the breeder section. They always yeah. have a little description. But forget. Yeah. Forget it. That, that was my research. Yeah, me too. There's sites like that. The, the, uh, the Canadian kennel sites and the American kennel sites. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Totally me too. Um, not, uh, they write that for people who already know about the breed. Yeah. So for anybody who's thinking of getting another dog, um, <laughs> we're going to give you some, some uh, well, definitely I would read Kim's book. Yeah. Um, for sure. And she has a great way of writing. It's it's kind of humor slash sar humor slash sarcastic, and it's written in a way that you can almost it's not anthropomorphic, but it it, it is written in a way in which you could totally visualize this dog. You know? Yeah, it, she's um, yeah, she's not writing above your head. Like you read this, and yeah. it's it's an easy enough read, and it's interesting. It's not yes. really dry. Yes, it's nice. Laugh. It, yeah. several of those made me laugh. Well, it makes you laugh because you have to, because yes, I have them. you're stuck with them. <laughs> yeah. no, pretty much. <laughs> so what else are you going to do? So you can do is laugh. But <laughs> having said that, you and I are never going to change breeds. We will continue to. Yeah, I like, I like the herding dog. Yeah, but it also helps greatly that we can understand. Um, I know that... Um, there are days when we just want to scream, shut the you know what up. But most days, we I now that I understand why it's happening, I, I I find I'm not as upset with my dogs. I'm not as frustrated about the situation because it's yeah. what it is. Two o'clock in the morning, we're a little upset about it, but that's okay. Um, you know, so I guess you know if anybody's looking to to buy a dog. Um, in the near future, definitely look um, at Kim's book um, for sure. I think that's the best source for anybody to go to. Um, for those of you who like uh, who like Celeste and I just went out and bought the dogs. They're <laughs> now trying to live with them. Um, there are things that we can do. Um, you know, it's not a hopeless case. You're not stuck with a dog. Um, you're not stuck with a border collie who chases cars all day long. Um, because they'll chase anything that's moving and that's just, you know, that's just what they do. Or you're not stuck with a, a border collie who's eye stalking your children and it looks like they're going to, you know, send them somewhere. Um, you know, there, we can, we can give them, um, uh, breed specific behaviors that will satisfy them, which can certainly tone down their need to do those in other situations. Um, I think the one thing that has saved you and I, all of us, um, all five dogs and you and I, is the fact that we do so much agility with our dogs. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I've never had any of my dogs look like they wanted to hurt anything. Um, you know, so uh, maybe that's helped, but there are definitely um, other activities that you can give to your dogs. You know, give them appropriate dogs, uh, appropriate dogs, appropriate jobs in appropriate situations. Um, and you know, we're a little bit fortunate if, if you know, you own a herding dog because it's not just agility. Herding dogs are also um, developed to um, look to their owners for any type of information. So I know that my dogs will do, they're happy to do any kind of training. Yeah. Any kind of training whatsoever. Yeah, I agree. You know, with that. you know, they'll do agility, they'll do rally. Annie has a little bit of trouble with rally. She does extreme rally. Um, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's ugly. Um, but, but definitely scent. Um, you know, if if you've got um, if you've got sight hounds or scent hounds, uh, lure coursing would be fabulous for them. You know, if you've got Portuguese water dogs, they can do dock diving. Um, I'm kind of, you know, sort of stereotyping them all, but there are endless dog activities out there in the world yeah. for, for dogs to do. And I'm pretty sure for most dogs, any kind of scent work or tracking work would be fantastic. You know, um, the, guardian, the guardian dogs are a little bit tougher um, because, you um, they're pretty, you know, there's not a lot of guardian dogs that want to come and do agility. Some have tried. It hasn't, they haven't, you know, 
they haven't lasted. It hasn't, you know, really worked that well for them. Um, you know, these are dogs that just like to be outside and out there checking, checking the world and um, making sure everybody in their herd is safe, people and dogs. So these are dogs that do need to get outside a lot. Um, our Malam Malamutes and, and sled dogs, also dogs that need to be outside a lot. So get your dogs out in the natural world, get them out into the forest where they can sniff and they can walk and, yeah. and put them on long lines. So, you know, because these are not breeds that are really into recall. Um, they're all independent breeds. I know I, you know, I worked for, I, I went to um, obedience classes back then. I think we went through like four levels of obedience, but that Malamute was never coming off a long line when he was out of our yard. Like you have to be realistic about these things with these dogs. So, you know, know that you may have to put a lot of management in place for them when you're, when you're out in the world with them, but that's okay. That's okay. You know, um, you know, what else? Sorry. I'm just checking. I don't want to miss anything. You know, um, even just um, for those dogs, for a lot of those dogs, even just going to training classes, because you, I, I think when you have these dogs, you do need the help of, of trainers because those dogs, a lot of these dogs and our dogs too, they, you know, there are times when we can let our guys make choices. My guys are off leash, but um, we had to learn to put a lot of structure in their environment and a lot of teaching so that they can be responsible off leash. Um, you know, the guardian dogs who, um, you know, are more protective, I, they do need boundaries as well. They need to learn that, you no, know, you don't have to um, protect your family from the visitors when the visitors arrive at the house. You need to go, you know, lie down, chill out and, you know, we've got this, you don't need, we don't need your protection, we've got this. So, you know, dogs do need to um, learn and specific breeds need to learn specific, you know, boundaries. So I think you do need to go to training and you do need to find trainers who understand those breeds as well. I think, you know, plus which is enrichment for the dog, you know, any training is enrich appropriate, any appropriate training is enrichment for your dog, you know. Yeah. And, and you know, the other thing, too, um, with most dogs is that I think it's important that um, just to get them out into the world with us as, as companions, uh, I try um, I try and get my guys out. We don't, you know, travel that far. But, you know, even if we're out working around the property, I take them with me now. So they're out there and, you know, they can practice um, line on boundaries. They can, you know, we can practice recalls. We can practice stays. We can do all that while I'm doing my job. I can, they can be working on some sort of job. But I, I, I think it's important for our dogs to get out. And I don't think in our world, it's, it's been a bad year, but even, you know, taking that into account, I don't think dogs are getting out enough into the world. Like two 20 minute walks a day is not enough for any of these breeds who basically did their jobs <laughs> outside. They, none of them, no, no one was bred to lie on a couch for eight hours a day or sit in a crate for six hours a day. So I think it's really stressful for them. Um, before COVID, we went to England on a trip and the first thing that hit me in England was the huge number of dogs that just were always out in the world with their owners. And they were all so chilled, couldn't care less about other people, couldn't care less about other dogs. They were in pubs, they were in, we were into fancy restaurants. They were under the tables in these fancy restaurants. They were in stores, they were everywhere. And um, I, I don't, didn't talk to enough people. I don't know why it is that way in England, other than, you know, a lot of, um, a lot, you know, a lot of dogs in England were working dogs, um, herding dogs, whatnot. I don't know. It's just the culture, but because these dogs were out in the world so much, the world wasn't totally Disneyland to them. It wasn't overwhelming. And I think that's what's happening here is, you know, your dog gets out for 20 minutes a day. They blow, they blow their brains out for 20 minutes a day because they're just overwhelmed and overexcited. Yeah. So, you know, it, you, you sh they should be able to go out with you and go on trips and be part of your daily life. And I know there's lots of people that do that, but I don't think there's enough people that do that. 
Yeah, yeah I think, um, cause I was reading an article that was, or it was like an interview um, from this vet in Ireland and it was the same thing. Dogs there are just mm-hmm. part of everyday life. They go places with you, they go into the stores, they go to the restaurants and they sleep under the tables. And yeah. and I think it's, I mean, the dogs are used to that, always being included, it's just normal life. But I think all the people around them are too. Like you take a dog out here and you're not just worrying about your dog, but you're worrying about all the people and how they're gonna react to your dog. Yeah, exactly. Like there's a lot more, Yeah, there's a lot more to deal with, I think, because it's yeah. not not the norm. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. The, most, the, 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 the one group of dogs that are super chilled out are, are street dogs. Yeah. Like in all these countries and just hang out on the streets and people feed them and the yeah. interactions are fairly, fairly laid back. So, you know, I think a lot of people, I think there's a bit of a cycle here is that people don't know how to, well, we know this from our program, from the games program is that people, everybody comes to us and says dogs are great in the house but oh my god how do we get them out in the world you know they don't pay any attention to us and i think people are afraid to take them out in the world because they aren't paying attention um you know all the restaurants and the pubs are well maybe not the restaurants but all the pubs and breweries are starting to um welcome dogs yeah we were at slap town cider last week and and they're a big dog place but there were dogs there that were definitely not ready to be there at, yes at this point they weren't you know disruptive but you could tell that they were a bit stressed and they were a bit overexcited um you know so like this is one of the things we do in the program is we teach dogs to disengage from their environment and focus on their owners and be okay with the environment um you know, if people can get their dogs into training programs that, that will help them get out in the world and get them out there because I think it's really important for their life. You know, it could be their job. I think it's Annie's job to go out in the world with us. It's Rosie's job to go out with me. You know, yeah. yeah, but right. then you, you do have the exception to that where some dogs are yes. not that dog. And, yeah. and you have to be able to recognize that too. Yes, we both have one of those. Yeah. Yeah, one of those each. You know, so um, yeah, but but the the majority, the majority, of, yeah, the majority of them can get out in the world and 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 participate in all the activities out there with us. So I think it's I think it's really important to do that as well. You yeah, know? Um, you know, and and just I, I think the first step is is for um, definitely people to who have who, those of us who have you know working working line dogs is to um, empathize with them first of all because you know I know I love my job I really like what I do I'm happy to get up and do it every day if that was taken away from me you know I I don't know how cranky and miserable I would be so you know they're just looking they're just lost without their job and looking for something and we always say you know if you don't give our dogs a job um, or hurting they'll find one yeah it's usually not the job we want them to do yeah so, that's true. so we do need to empathize and, and understand that um you know this is why they're doing what they're doing and and as i said um about the barking if you understand it certainly helps you feel better about it yourself so yeah. it does you know owners have this pain point we just want this behavior fixed or get rid of it or fix it but, you know, we've seen time and time again, if we explain why it's happening, they go, oh, okay, I get it. Not a problem. You know, just tell me how I'm going to fix it. You know, mm-hmm. no, just tell me what I can give my dog instead. Because yeah. that's the new way of thinking, certainly um, around here, is what can we give the dog instead so that they're enriched and satisfied and not doing it in, in the wrong context, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And, and, you know, if you haven't purchased a dog and you're thinking of purchasing a dog, the first thing probably to think of is um, what is my life going to look like for the next 10 years, 10, 15 years while I have this dog? You know, am I going to be in an apartment or a condo? And I shouldn't buy a Malamute. Um, You know, I shouldn't, you know, probably buy a herding dog. You know, I need to buy a dog who's a little more chilled and can, you know, handle being in a condo. And, you know, not to say that there aren't people in apartments that are good with herding dogs and can get them out. But for the most part, it's, it's a heck of a lot easier for me to get my dogs out into the world and nature and whatever than it is when you're downtown in a condo. So, it, you know, am I going to have kids? You know, 
know, or are we just starting a new family? Um, maybe, you know, a border collie isn't the way to go if you're going to, you know, have young children in the house for the next 10 years because they will want to hurt your children. So it, it's just more a case of just thinking these things through and understanding what you can give your dog and, um, you know, what, um, what, you know, what you can give this dog that's going to satisfy them through the course of their life. And in a way that can you have one of these dogs that fits into your life successfully, you know? Yeah. Or can you fit into their life successfully? Yes. 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 Um, you know, and the other thing is, um, too, um, here's an interesting one is even if you don't buy a purebred dog, if you just buy, if you're buying a mixed breed dog, um, that's a whole interesting situation in itself as well. Yeah. Um, you know, how many, um, and uh, I'm not, let me say right up front, I'm not missing doodles in any way. We have lots of doodles in the program. I think they're really great. Um, but I think people, need to understand that um, just mixing something with a poodle is not necessarily going to take the um, take the excitement out of the other half, like uh, Aussie doodles, for instance. How many yeah. Aussie doodles have we met that were um, chilled and calm? We haven't met any yet. seems to me that the Aussie brain takes over that, the whole doodle body there. But um, you know, I, I think sometimes people are surprised at um, how bouncy and energetic doodles are. I, I think they're expecting something a little bit different as well. Yeah. Well, you know, I think when doodles are advertised, um, they really lean on the the no shed or low shedding quality. And they don't really remind people how intelligent poodles are. <laughs> yes. So yeah. you're missing a very, you're mixing a very intelligent breed with another intelligent active breed or like so yes. you're getting it's like a double whammy i think yes yes and brophy says that in her book you're not necessarily going to dilute the characteristics of the other dogs so, yeah um, the poodle in your doodle might not dilute the aussie in your doodle. right so um, then you get both yeah exactly yeah. exactly and you know the other thing too is um working lines as opposed to show lines because we've had a number of our people come to us um, who said, oh my goodness, we, they told us we were buying a show golden and what have I got on my hands? Why is this like thing like out of its mind? And we take a take one look and we go, ah, yeah, you have a field golden. Yeah. Which is um, a dog who is still bred for field work and bred to be high drive and a uh, high drive workaholic dog. And, and mm -hmm. there's high drive as the Oz, as the um, border sometimes. So you have to be very careful about what you're getting from your breeder as well or what you're, wherever you're buying the dog, definitely. Yeah. Um, there is a difference there, and a lot of our owners um, have been very surprised at, at the except the the um, energy level of their dogs. So, so you really need to do your dil due diligence on that one, and and just you know don't be like Celeste and I do a lot of work before you <laughs> investigate a lot before you get your dogs. We were lucky; we got good dogs. And, yes, we do have good dogs, you know, but we have. A, I wish I knew then what I know now. I wouldn't have changed. I would still have, have I would still have bought what I bought. Um, but it, it, it's good to know now what we do. It's it's definitely to have better well, it, our education as to what kind of dogs that we actually have in our houses. Yeah, because now we can we can work with them and keep them happy and us happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have yeah. to admit our frustration levels here are. are, are quite a bit lower than they used to be. Yeah. Before. I really, really got that explanation again from Kim Brophy about dogs. So, you know, if, if you are um, interested, um, definitely um, Kim Brophy is on everybody's blog posts these days. Um, definitely she's on Michael Shikashio's um, The Bitey End of the Dog. There's a few others. If you just uh, Google Kim Brophy and blog posts, you'll probably find them all. If I, find some of the others, I'll, I'll post some up for people. Um, and the book is fantastic. I, I try and anybody who comes to our program for puppies now, we try and get them to um, 
actually buy two books. And I think I talked about these books last week, which was Enrichment for the Real World, yeah. um, which is a fantastic book for everybody. And that's um, Emily Strong and Ali Bender. Mm -hmm. And definitely meet your dog, um, Kim Brophy, because it, I've just touched on what she, she goes through in that book. The book is fantastic. So uh, definitely that's a good one for anybody to purchase for, for your existing dog or your future dogs, for sure. So um, I doubt there are any questions. No, there? we do. We have some comments. Oh, okay. So, cool. and there's a couple, I mean, oh, Gimli. There's a couple that are, uh, you know, talking about their specific pups, but as a general thing, what about, um, I mean, Michelle has has mutts, so she's like, "How can you tell what they were bred for when you have something that's like a husky shepherd cross or a husky lab pug, and like you don't know?" So that's that's interesting because yeah, you know, you know what, um, Michelle, uh, Michelle, Kim Brophy mentioned something about that in her book, and. Mm -hmm. I'm just having one of my Alzheimer's moments and it's out of my head, but I will look that up and send that on to, is it Michelle Cummings? Yes. Michelle. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll send that to you, Michelle, because she had some good suggestions. Um, but, but basically research, if, if you know the breeds um, that are in your dog, um, you definitely need to research both of them, which is what we were just talking about with the, the, the doodles, you know, um, the, the the Aussie doodles and now they have border doodles. Um, so you definitely do need to, to know what's in both of them. And you need to know that when you make these changes in, in, in breeding um, or, you know, in the form, behaviors will change. So um, this is not my field of expertise, but I know that in breeding and genetics and reproduction that form and function um, pretty much go hand in hand. So um, we've had a, a number of conversations about the fact that purebred dogs, and I'm not saying don't get rescues or anything like that. This is just a fact that purebred dogs, um, when they keep uh, the the function of the dogs the same, the dog or they keep the appearance of the dog the same, and the, it's very much related to the the function of the dog. You know, behavior and appearance are very much related in genetics. So when you start mixing, you're going to get different outcomes. Um, and so I'm not sure that you can totally figure out what you're going to get behavior wise from your um, predictability wise from a mixed breed dog, but you can definitely look into both all the breeds that are invested in that dog and, and sort of start to see if you can pick out those those qualities and those behaviors in your own dog. But yeah. I'll, 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 I'll dig that out of Kim's book for sure. Yeah, but I, I like that because even if um, you don't know exactly what's in there, you're like based on some behaviors and general idea of what's in there, you could say, oh, yeah, this is the herding dog part coming out. Yeah. Those you know, and then maybe this is what I can do to make your life mm -hmm. more enjoyable or more enriched yeah. and stop you from doing this other thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 I tend to whenever we see. Um, Whenever you see herding dog mixes, I, we tend to, you and I, maybe we're biased, we tend to see the herding dog characteristics for sure. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. And, and, and Michelle, I know you have northern breeds too. So um, for yeah. you, because you have northern breeds, you really do need to look at Kim's book. And because honest to God, the, the, um, the write up on the northern breeds, she calls them something else, natural dogs, I think. I think it's natural dogs, um, was just like, just nailed my Malamute totally. So yeah. definitely look that up, Michelle, in, in her book, because yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then, and then another question um, again, specific stories about the, the dog itself, but she used to have a standard poodle and now she has a mini. Do mini. How do min miniature versions of their? They're different. They yeah, they can different. be different. And again, this is not my field of expertise. Other yeah. than you and I, anecdotally, we were talking. Was it last night when we were walking up the hill and we were talking about mini Aussies and toy Aussies? Uh, not yesterday, but there was a day. Yeah. Okay. 
And um, again, I wonder, and this is not my area of expertise, I'm just surmising here that, you know, people are changing the breed standards for Aussies. So when you change the breed standards appearance wise, I do think you are going to get um, possible changes in behavior as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's a fantastic book out there. This is where I first heard about that concept. And it's not a concept, it's, it's, it's a fact in science um, from Temple Grandin. Um, Temple Grandin, Kim Brophy um, referred to her as an ethologist as well. But Temple Grandin is just like incredible. Um, she changed the cattle industry for. Um, oh, okay, yeah, for, I love your time. Um, by by changing all of the the stock yards and the way um, everybody dealt with with the animals there. She has a book called Animals in Translation, and. Um, I haven't read it for years, but um, somebody reminded me of that the other day, and I'm going to dig it up and read it again, because it was the first book I read of this sort about ethology, and it is about ethology, and it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where I first heard, that was years ago, about when you change appearances, you will also get changes somewhere else um, along the line, usually in behavior. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I, again, no fact here, just this is what I was told. So, yeah. So yeah. Whoever, whoever put that comment there, did they say whether they actually see a difference, found a difference? Um, yeah, I mean, I can read your comment. Mm -hmm. uh, mini poodles, a bit anxious, getting better at treats. Um, she thought a smaller poodle would be easier as she gets older. Uh, the standard poodle was very chill, could do anything, go anywhere. Mini Poodle will only walk a few blocks from the house, needs to drive elsewhere, needs to walk with them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I She's did, just curious about the traits. I did read um, <clears throat> in the trainer groups uh, um, about mini Aussies and toy Aussies in that they seem to be um, a little more wired than standard Aussies. Hard to believe. So maybe Poodles um, are who similar? Knows, who knows? I have no idea. We're just, yeah. we're just shooting the you know what here on this mm -hmm. but, um, definitely I would look into Kim's book and I would read Temple Grandin's book as well um, if anybody is interested in learning more about this yeah um, both of those books are fabulous you know and they're way more qualified to talk about this stuff than I am basically yeah we're just we're kind of just the source of telling you where to look yeah yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just reliably a lot of it. information from Kim Brophy into this um, yeah. in the book, and um, hopefully, uh, as I go through the course, I'll be able to to funnel more out to people. But yeah, um, you know. Anyway, okay. And, and one more about, and just with a question mark. What about Barbés? They're water dogs, are they not? Are they mm -hmm. like Portuguese water dogs? Yeah. Like yeah. similar but not the same. I, yeah. I don't know what. That yeah, that's another working dog, though. So yes. you'll want to look that up. Yes, I have. I have a client I was actually speaking to yesterday who has had five Portuguese water dogs. Yeah. Um, and she's there. She said they've all been fabulous. Yeah. Working dogs. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So See, you know, just for fun, it would be interesting if people who are listening want to post. Um, you know, about your dog, it'd be, you know, we were talking about this the other day is that um, why we bought these dogs and what we think is really great about them and um, what we found to be the downside of them. Be interesting to hear from people. Yeah, you know? and the upside. Yes. Because there is an upside. Too. Yeah, what's really great about them. Yeah, yeah. I, I love Aussies because they're incredibly trainable and yeah. totally easy to work with in that yeah. sense. You know, yeah. you, you just have to... You just have to deal with the control freak issues, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so, hopefully, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, if anybody has any questions or comments, please put them in for us and we will answer them and, and uh, maybe we get a little conversation going about the good and the bad of all the breeds. Um, we shouldn't say good and bad. We should say upside and downside. Let's that, not be judgmental. Um, mm -hmm. And next week um, we are going to talk about learning. Um That'll be the third of this, this series. So we're going to talk about learning, not in the traditional sense of let's go to obedience school, but other kinds of learning that our dogs are engaged in. So anyway, thanks, Celeste, for uh, being here today. Thanks, Penny. I can see your ears in the background. I know. 
she's she was a very good girl. She did not address her. She did not attend to her job. For, you know, no, her job right now is eating, is watching the screen and, and seeing when, yeah, seeing when treats it. happen. <laughs> Finding food on the ground is a real job for a dog. So and that's she what she's doing. Me. So there's a perfect example of <laughs> an inappropriate job and giving them another one instead. So yeah. There we go. Okay. Thanks, Celeste. And thank, thank you. everybody who joined us. We will um, see you next Thursday. And everybody have a good week. Take care.